Story time. It's 2011. Diedrich Stapel is a very respected social psychologist at the University of Tilburg in the Netherlands. At the moment, Stapel is not in Tilburg though. Instead, he is at Utrecht Central train station. He's here because he's looking for something. Back up a few months. In April of 2011, Stapel published a paper in Science, one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world. In the paper, Stapel and his co-author wanted to find out if there is a relationship between discrimination and how disordered people's surroundings are. The paper's most eye-catching study was a field experiment conducted at Utrecht Central Station. In the experiment, Stapel asked white participants to fill out a questionnaire in a seat among a row of six chairs. The row was empty, except for the first chair. That chair was occupied either by a black or a white person. Stapel and his co-author report in the paper that participants on average sat farther away from the black person when the surrounding area was dirty and strewn with garbage. It was a clever experiment with nice results. In fact, this was only the latest of a long list of nice results that Stapel had published up to this point in his career. A bit too nice, perhaps. This, at least, was what a small group of graduate students at Staples University had begun to suspect. The graduate students had gotten a hold of a number of Staples data files. When they investigated these files, they discovered numerous inconsistencies and anomalies, including one case where it looked like Staples had just copied and pasted rows of data. In the summer of 2011, the students told the head of the psychology department about their suspicions. Huh? A short time later, the head of the psychology department informed the university rector and then also confronted Stapel. This brings us back to Stapel, walking around Utrecht Central Station. He's there because the allegations against him are all true. In particular, Stapel never ran the experiment at Utrecht Central Station which supposedly showed that white people are more racist when their surroundings are dirty. In fact, Stapel did not even bother to go to Utrecht at all. Instead, he just sat at his computer and typed numbers into a spreadsheet that were in line with what he thought should happen in the experiment. So now, Stapel is in Utrecht, looking around the station to find a location that matches the description of the experiment site that he gave in his paper. The problem is, he can't find one. It is here where, at last, Stapel decides that enough is enough. That night, he confesses to his wife. A week later, the university suspends him from his professorship and announces his fraud publicly. Stapel did not only fabricate the data for this one experiment. Far from it. In their final report, the university committees investigating Stapel concluded that at least 50 of his published papers involved some kind of fraud. Another highlight is a study that never ended up being published, which supposedly showed that people eat more M&Ms from a mug that says capitalism on it than from a different mug. Stapel made up the data for that study at his home, all the while eating a lot of the M&Ms himself. Diedrich Stapel is probably the most well-known and most extreme recent case of fraud in psychology, but is he the only one? How common is fraud in psychological research? and what can be done about it. This is what we are going to talk about in this episode of our ongoing series on the replication crisis in psychology. Before we get into this though, since we have been known to pretend at parties that we're philosophers, we should define fraud. By fraud, we mean any deliberate attempt to deceive others about one or more aspects of one's research. In psychology, the most common form of fraud is faking or modifying research data, like we have seen in the Stapel case. But of course, data fudging is not the only way to commit fraud in psychology. Other ways include lying about the design of materials used in a study, misrepresenting how the data of a study were analyzed, falsely reporting the results of an analysis, or choosing to omit some results from a paper, for example, those results that do not fit with the theory that the researchers said they wanted to test. One important thing to stress about fraud is that it is different from honest mistakes. Fraud is deliberate. Stapel knew full well that he was faking his data and that this was not okay. In contrast, 
even though Stapel's many co-authors also put their names to results and papers based on such data, they had no idea that this was what they were doing. So while Stapel and his co-authors both had a hand in introducing a pile of useless results into the psychological literature, only Stapel is guilty of fraud because as far as we know at least, only Stapel knew what was going on. It's not hard to see that we cannot trust fraudulent research. Like we said in our last video, psychology uses data collected in carefully designed empirical studies to find out things about the world and the people in it. In cases of data fraud, however, the data did not in fact come from an empirical study. Instead, the data, or at least part of it, were made up by the researchers. Clearly then, such data do not tell us anything at all about the question or problem that the study which supposedly produced the data was meant to probe. When researchers lie about their methods, analyses or results, they may in fact have run some sort of study and their data may even be informative under other circumstances. As things are, however, we again cannot learn anything from their research. For that, we would have to know what study the researchers actually conducted, what analyses they actually ran and what the results actually were. And that we don't know. Alright, so fraud is very bad news. So far, so uncontroversial. But is this really such a big issue when it comes to the trustworthiness of the psychological literature on the whole? Surely, only a tiny proportion of psychologists ever commit fraud, right? It is not at all easy to get an estimate of how widespread fraud is in psychology. One rather obvious reason for this is that fraudsters usually do not want to get caught and so take measures to make this more difficult. Another reason is that scientists can actually be a bit squeamish when it comes to the topic of fraud. This may be a bit surprising, since having one's research critically evaluated again and again by other scientists is one of psychology's main quality control mechanisms. Think back to the last video and our discussion of peer review. At the same time, however, psychology and science more broadly is also based on a lot of trust between researchers. And so few scientists like to entertain the thought that some of their colleagues may be taking advantage of their trust by committing fraud. Nevertheless, there are meta-scientists who have tried to put numbers on this question. One approach is to look at how many cases of fraud are detected. For example, the blog Retraction Watch maintains a database of retracted scientific papers across a variety of disciplines, including psychology. At the time of writing this video, Retraction Watch lists around 90 psychology papers that have been retracted due to some kind of fraud since 2010. Given that every year, psychology journals publish many, many thousands of new papers, this number may seem reassuringly low. However, it is very likely that this number greatly underestimates the actual rate of fraud in psychology, since most fraudulent papers are almost certainly never discovered. A more promising approach is to ask psychologists themselves using anonymous surveys. In a systematic review of seven such surveys, Daniele Fanelli found that about 2% of scientists admitted to having fabricated or modified data or results at least once in their careers. A systematic review is a kind of paper that systematically looks for all existing evidence on a given topic or research question, and then often also aggregates these results in some way. Finelli also looked at studies that asked scientists about the behaviour of their colleagues, of which he found 12. Overall, the surveyed scientists estimated that about 14% of their colleagues had committed fraud at least once in their careers. Finelli's systematic review included scientists from many different areas, however, unfortunately, it did not include many psychologists. Luckily, in 2019, Johannes Stricker and Armin Günther conducted a similar systematic review specifically focusing on psychology. In the six studies that they found, psychologists estimated that 9.3 to 18.7% of their colleagues had committed data fraud at least once, and 0.6 to 2.3% of psychologists admitted to having fabricated data at least once themselves. Both results are quite similar to what Finelli found in his earlier systematic review of scientists more broadly. So, how much fraud is there in psychology? While these results are of course not conclusive, they at least pretty strongly suggest two things. First, the vast majority of psychologists likely never commit fraud. 
This is encouraging, though to be honest, not committing fraud is also a very low bar to clear. At the same time, it is also pretty clear that the proportion of fraudsters in psychology is not zero. In fact, if we believe what psychologists say about each other, then this proportion is quite a bit higher than zero. And this should worry us. Any proportion greater than zero is too great. We have learned that, some psychologists at least, do become fraudsters. A natural next question to ask is, why? One possible explanation is about incentives. Psychology, and academia more generally, values and rewards findings that are new, clever and surprising. A surefire way to guarantee that you will get findings like this is to just make them up. Therefore, all psychologists have a strong incentive to make up results and some of them give in to this incentive. There is some evidence at least to support this explanation. Fraudsters who have been discovered often say things that are in line with the incentives made me do it explanation. For example, here's Staple talking in an interview about the state of psychology. There are scarce resources, you need grants, you need money. There is competition. Normal people go to the edge to get that money. Science is, of course, about discovery, about digging to discover the truth. But it is also communication, persuasion, marketing. I'm a salesman. I'm on the road. Also, psychology papers are more often retracted for fraud from high prestige journals than from low prestige journals. This could at least suggest that the prestige is part of the motivation for fraud, though this may also just reflect that papers in higher prestige journals get more attention and so when they involve fraud this is more likely to be discovered. Another intriguing, though perhaps a bit counterintuitive explanation is that far from not caring about the truth enough, fraudsters actually care about it too much, but they have a distorted idea of what the truth is. Stapel, for example, has stated in interviews that early on in his career, he ran normal studies like everybody else. But, he says, he became frustrated when the data did not turn out supporting his hypotheses, which he was convinced were true. So, he decided to give the truth a helping hand and fudge the data so that they would fit it. Whatever their reasons, fraudsters can cause a lot of damage to the reputation of psychology and to the trustworthiness of the psychological literature. So, what's to be done? As you might imagine, this is a huge question and we can only scratch the surface here. We just talked about some of the reasons that seem to motivate fraudsters. One of them was that researchers who commit fraud often do so because there are strong incentives pulling them in this direction. If this is right, then here is one natural solution to the problem of fraud in psychology, change the incentives. For example, instead of rewarding surprising findings a lot, psychology could instead place more emphasis on things like methodological rigor, sound statistical analyses, transparency and replicability. While this may sound straightforward on paper, it is in fact not difficult to imagine that this is much easier said than done. Likely, it would involve drastic changes to the entire way psychology is currently being done. We will almost certainly have more to say about psychology's incentive structures in later videos. In addition to making fraud less rewarding, psychology could also strive to make it more costly. Typically, fraudsters lose their academic positions and have at least some of their published works retracted from the journals that they first appeared in. Ways to go beyond this include retracting all papers that a known fraudsters a co-author on, not just the ones for which fraud has been proven, making sure that known fraudsters can never work in academia again, or even making scientific fraud a criminal offence, which is something that some people in the Netherlands have called for after the Stapel affair first became public. Even if the incentive structures could be meaningfully changed, it is unlikely that fraud would ever be completely eradicated. Hence, psychology also needs to make sure that when fraud happens, it is discovered. One particular measure that could help a lot in this respect is to require researchers to make their raw data files publicly available whenever possible. The reasoning behind this is simple. In the past, when cases of fraud have been discovered, this has almost always involved someone taking a closer look at the raw data for a study and noticing something odd. We have seen this in the Stapel case, for example, where one of the major giveaways was that one of his data files contained rows that had been copied and pasted. In fact, data detectives have developed several clever techniques to detect foul play in raw datasets. Some of these are really quite cool. 
Unfortunately, this video would get a bit too long if we discussed this in more detail here. So, we decided to release a companion video to this one that will take you through one of these raw data investigations in detail. We hope that you will also join us for that one. That is all we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching this video. We hope that you have enjoyed it, or if you didn't enjoy it, that you at least found it interesting. In the next video in this series, we will dive into the world of questionable research practices. Did you know that listening to the Beatles song, When I'm 64, literally makes people older? Sounds impossible? Well, think again. Because in 2011, psychologists ran and published a study that shows exactly this. With questionable research practices, nothing is impossible. This and more next time.